Hi, this is Katie Wardrobe, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical Youth, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm talking with Katie Wardrobe, the founder of Midnight Music, a site I've followed for several years because it is the go-to place to learn about cool new music tools and websites and get insights on how they can be used in music education. Katie runs hands-on workshops, she presents regularly at conferences in Australia and overseas, and she offers online training and support to music teachers all over the world through her music technology professional development community, the Midnight Music Community. She is also the author of Studio Sessions, a keyboard and technology program for middle school, and she's the host of the weekly Music Tech Teacher podcast. One thing I've always admired is how Katie is always able to find interesting and creative ways to use new music websites and apps for practical teaching purposes. I loved having the chance to pick her brains on how best to use music tech in education, as well as learning a bit more about her own background and what led her to having such a creatively focused perspective on technology in music education. In this conversation, we talk about how growing up as the daughter of two music teacher parents impacted her early music education, and whether she believes it was nature or nurture that led to her becoming a music teacher herself. We talk about her opinion on whether easy music-making technology reduces or even removes the need for spending time learning music in the traditional way. She gives her top suggestions for free online tools you can use today to develop your musicality in fun and interesting ways. This conversation is packed with useful ideas for self-taught musicians and music teachers alike. And I know you're going to come away with at least one, but probably several, cool new ideas for using technology in your musicality training. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I'd love to start out by hearing a bit about how you got started in music. When did you first start learning and and what did that look like for you? Um, I've had a really um, very musical background because both of my parents are music teachers. I say are. They're actually, you know, both of them 73, I think, at this stage. And they are still teaching, even though they're both in theory retired, because I, I think they just can't give it up. <laughs> but um, grew up with lots of music, you know, all around me all the time. And uh, they're both uh, conductors and accompanists and do a lot of playing and singing and, you know, instruments and, and whatever. But started learning uh, piano formally at the age of five and then took up other instruments along the way, which was really good. But But we really had a lot of singing around, you know, from a really early age and me and my brother used to get dragged along to choir rehearsals actually as kids uh, that my parents were both involved in and we'd just have to sit in the corner playing, you know, with matchbox cars and Lego and stuff like that <laughs> while they did that. And so that it was like a full immersion, I think, from a really early age. Mm, I, I know a few families like that where both parents are professional classical musicians of one kind or another or music teachers and it does seem like there's a, a real correlation with the kids going into music in a serious way too. Do you think it, it's a nature or a nurture thing? Is it because you had that genetic background that you were inevitably going to go into music or was <laughs> it that full immersion that did it, do you think? I, th- I really think it's the immersion thing. I mean, a lot of people say to me, oh, it's, you know, I mean, I guess that they say, oh, of course you would have ended up being a musician and my brother as well. And I mean, I think that's true to some degree because we were so surrounded by it when we were growing up. But I really do think it was simply our exposure to it. I mean, if some other kid had come along with us and, you know, been around at the same time and and had music all the time, I really think that that they would have ended up in the same way. And we were never forced to go into music. It was just, but it was just there and it was such a big part of our lives. So I think uh, we were always going to both be musicians, me and my brother. And yeah, I do, I do think it's, I, I think it's more the nurture thing. <laughs> I was trying to think which one is it, <laughs> nurture <laughs> rather than nature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you started piano at age five. What did the next five or 10 years look like for you for learning music? 
Um, uh, piano was great. I, I really loved doing piano and I felt from an early age, you know, my piano teacher would uh, play the next few pieces that I could choose from to learn. And, and each year I thought, wow, I'm going to sound so good when I can play that one. And, you know, even I was even thinking that at, you know, age six or seven and probably the pieces were so simple, but I was so excited because they, they were by really famous people like Mozart and Beethoven and so on. And then after that, um, I did learn cello just for a little bit uh, from for about a year when I was uh, in grade five, I think, but I really did not like my cello teacher. So I gave that up, um, which is a bit sad. If I'd kept going, it would have been a really great thing. Um, but so that that was, you know, primary school age. And then later on picked up, um, I started playing woodwind instruments really. So uh, I learned oboe and later on bassoon. I secretly learned bassoon for a bit. My, my oboe teacher didn't know that because I had access to instruments at the school, uh, I took a bassoon home, you know, and thought I'll just have a go. And <laughs> and so I, I got that because, you know, access through my parents because they were both teaching at the school that my brother and I were attending and took the bassoon home for a bit and uh, my obey teacher said, mm, something, something's not quite right. Your embouchure, you know, it's not so good. And I think he kind of realized I was secretly playing the bassoon and he said, you have to make a choice, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't so good. <laughs> That's tremendous. What a musical rebellion to take up the bassoon in secret. <laughs> and the reason I took it up was because the uh, only bassoon player at the school actually left and leaving the school with no bassoon players. And uh, there was two oboe players, me and this other guy. And so I thought, you know, I want to be the only one in the school doing something. So I took the bassoon up at that time. <laughs> mm. So it sounds like it was quite... Um, a traditional formal style of music education. Was there anything else that was more formal or instinctive or relaxed for you in terms of exploring your musicality? Um, I think this, the singing part of everything was a really great way to to learn and, and play and that sort of thing. I mean, we were singing from an early age, you know, I mentioned that both parents were involved with choirs and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, we were brought up with a very classical music background and, totally about music reading really and so we you know me and my brother are good at reading music and sight reading and that sort of thing but um that that was that part of it but uh we started playing you know on our own and I think it's that um you know improvising and and having a go at stuff that that became a really good part of things and yeah the, the singing part though I think was was just really great me and my brother used to play at home even on the piano and kind of muck around together a lot. And I think that was a massive part of just exploring musicality. Um, we we used to play <laughs> at the time it was, um, what's that Richard Mark? Is it Richard Mark's song? Wherever you go, wherever you go, whatever you do. That one, I will be right here waiting. That song. I used to play that on the piano. It's very easy to play. And uh, my brother used to come along and he would play it as well. He wasn't even a pianist, but he would play it a semitone apart from where I was playing it on the piano. So he would put his hands kind of over the top of mine or an octave higher on on the other keys, like the white keys instead of the black keys or vice versa. And we used to play it like that. And my mum would be cooking in the kitchen and just screaming at, please stop, make it stop, <laughs> make it stop. But we did a lot of experimenting with my brother. And I think that was a great part of actually um, just learning music and getting better at things because we just explored stuff. We just we just had fun with it. And I taught him piano, even though he's not he's a drummer. And so he plays piano at the time he was playing the piano with his two first fingers, kind of like drumsticks. And he was amazing at doing trills and things. He would do like a like a drum roll, which was the trill on the piano. Crazy stuff that but that's how we we did a lot of playing and learning at that time. And yeah, we just had a lot of fun with that, I think. Mm, that's wonderful. I think you were lucky to have a sibling like that because I think a lot of children who had the kind of education you had in terms of your official education don't necessarily find that opportunity to to explore that other side of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I really think that's a, a big part of it is just kind of mucking around and, and having him there all the time to do that. I mean, by, both my parents were obviously there and, um, you know, we, we made music together. One really early memory actually is of us recording um, I was born in England, so my family's from England um, as well. And we recorded a like a version of Happy Birthday for my aunt in England. And 
we recorded it in four part harmony. So my brother was only about five at the time and he sang the melody and I sang the alto part because I could hold the alto part and mum and dad sang the tenor and bass parts and, and we recorded it and sent it off. I really wish I had a copy of that recording. I think it went on a cassette tape at the time overseas. <laughs> and were there any big discoveries for you as you did that exploration with your brother? Were there any kind of um, insights or breakthroughs that helped you turn into the musician you are today, uh, who I would think of as a very creative and uh, expressive kind of musician and music teacher? Yeah, I think um, I always still consider it, it's that very stereotypical issue of being brought up a classical musician and reading music a lot and not improvising as much. I actually realised over time that my, my brother was heading more into kind of jazz music and he learnt you know, fairly early on, you know, well, in our teen years, he learnt kind of like scales, like the blues scale, and and he could play them quite fluently, even on the piano, which wasn't his instrument, very annoying. And he kind of based a lot of what he was doing on that and moved more into that improvisation type style, which I found a real struggle, you know, real struggle. I'm, I'm pretty good actually at playing from a chord chart. I can improvise in that way. I can play from a chord chart quite easily and make up, you know, whatever on the piano to go along with the song and that's really good but just sort of that free improvising like hey do a solo for the next eight bars <laughs> that, that sort of thing Ooh, freaked me out I would like pre-organize it and <laughs> work it out ahead of time but he could really easily do that so I kind of realized that, that was probably a good way to go and um, both of my parents were just not quite into that jazz improvisation stuff I, I felt like it was a forbidden type of music when I was growing up, even though they never said that. I'm sure they, they would have not minded at all if I'd gone down that road. But later on, I developed this love for jazz. And I think it was, um, you know, I wish I'd sort of done it earlier and been able to improvise and, and to kind of get the, the gist of that being, you know, being fluent in all those different scales and modes would have actually helped a lot. So, yeah, so it's something I'm kind of working a bit more on now, <laughs> which is a good thing. And... Outside of the kind of instrument technique and lessons and passing exams that you were presumably doing, what what were you able to learn or teach yourself that let you follow your brother a bit or let you feel a bit more free and creative and, and play by ear or do that side of things? I think um, just playing at home by yourself and you know, just having that time. I used to love it when everybody went out of the house and I had a couple of hours by myself at home because I think I felt a bit self-conscious mucking around in front of other people and I, I wanted the freedom to do that without anyone around. So I spent a lot of time transcribing songs that I like to hear on the radio. So, you know, I'll show my age here, but growing up, you know, in the, the late 70s and 80s, you know, it was Billy Joel and Elton John and listening to those people and just kind of thinking, I really want to play that Billy Joel song. So I would actually listen a lot to the recordings and um, and just sit at the piano and work them out. And those days you, you didn't have ready access to recordings like you do now. So you either had to go and buy the entire album, which was expensive, or the single, but only if they had a single version of it, you know, to buy. Or you do what most of us did, which was listen to the radio with a cassette tape poised to record at any time. And as soon as the song came on, you just hit the button and, and record the song and keep a copy on your cassette tape. So I did a lot of that and just uh, played along with songs and, and worked them out. And I think I realized from an early age that because I'd grown up in that sort of environment, I could work out the notes and work out the chords of a song and that was so much fun. I, I still love doing that even today. I've done a lot of transcribing for people, like professional transcribing jobs, writing down, you know, what I hear and um, putting it into notation so that other people can play it. But uh, I always found that really fun. And I think that's one of the biggest things that developed my, you know, musical ear really. And yeah, just, just mucking around with it and, and seeing if I could work out what to do and how to do it and how that person was doing it on the recording. So much fun. I think for a lot of musicians who are trained in the note reading classical way, that kind of transcription challenge can be a bit overwhelming because they feel like any note is possible. Was there anything that helped you get better at it quicker or that kind of made it more approachable for you, given that you had that kind of training yes. in your background? Yes, totally. I think it's the realisation that you're in a key, so <clears throat> let's say you're in G major, and so instantly 
you kind of most of the time, and it's not true for everything for the entire song all the time, but you know, if you're in a key like G major, you you kind of go, well, those are the notes that are the most likely that are going to be in the song, in the melody, for instance. And also those are the most likely chords. You know, if you if you get quite familiar with the the tonic chord of G major is G major, and then you know the five chord is D major and, and so on. You know, especially pop music or jazz, you know, it's, it's fairly predictable in that the chords are going to be based on those things. So I used to treat it like a puzzle, like a process of elimination. And if there was a chord I couldn't work out, I would go, well, in G major, I've probably got these main ones at my disposal. And so I'd do all the, the ones I could hear really easily and then I'd fill in the gaps with that. And that realisation, um, you know, that, that everything's based around that tonic key for the most part. And of course, there's so many exceptions to this, but, you know, for a lot of music, it really is based around that tonic key. It's just so great. And I had this realisation in my, I think my teens where with sight singing and, and playing and so on, that that whole system of uh, using Roman numerals and, um, you know, I, I grew up learning sort of solfa as well. So, you know, do and so um, using that system of basing everything around the tonic just made so much sense to me. And I, I don't understand the people who use the fixed do system, you know, in solfa where C is do no matter what key you're in, just doesn't make sense. I feel like they're missing out on this awesome system of, of you know, analysing music. And it, it's just so much easier when you know that that system. And it doesn't matter whether you're using solfa or numbers. Uh, it's all the same. You're just labelling it with different things. But to know that the one chord is this and the five chord is this and the, the four chord and so on, that just, it was like this massive light bulb moment, I think, growing up. And, and I felt like that's the way, for me, that was the way I could sight sing quite easily. So if people put music in front of me, I could actually fairly easily sing it straight away, even if I didn't know the song, because I would relate everything to the tonic and the, you know, the, the main note of the, the scale sounds a certain way in that key and then the five sounds a certain way and so I could sort of pick out the notes that way and it, it's not a, an instant process but over time you know you find you get better and better at it if you keep practicing so it's a good thing. <laughs> I love hearing you describe that because I can relate to it so much and for me unfortunately it was a much later discovery and you know these days at Musical U that's very much the approach we use we have movable dose sulfur for the relative pitch of notes oh, and then we feel. do the <laughs> yeah. we do the Roman numeral chord system for the one four five and six and it's just, it's astonishing to me even today how much that's missing from the traditional classical music education. And, yeah. you know, I, I still find it hard to believe that I managed to get through 10 or 15 years of instrument lessons and getting very good at reading music and passing exams without anyone really getting that across to me that, you know, this is why the key matters and this is why these chords go together. And, you know, if you are going to try and transcribe something, it's not any note is possible. You can, you know, infer an enormous amount just from the key, like yeah. you described. Yeah, I, I don't understand either. I had the same experience. Nobody really talked about any of that growing up. And there was sort of tiny bits of that information along the way, but it was never connected and no one, yeah, no one presented it as a, a thing <laughs> and just... That's, you know, that, that sulfur thing, you know, growing up, I had some Kodai training and um, and to me, that's one of their strong points is that they do relate everything to the key. And you find that, like I find that certain chords in a key have qualities about them. So there's a certain feeling about the five chord because it wants to go back to the one, you know, and, and there's a certain feeling about the four chord or the two chord and and that that's kind of harder or longer to pick up but the more you listen and the more you think about those things it's much easier to work out and you know when you're listening to a song if you're towards the end of a phrase you know you're not on the tonic yet what's the next likely chord that it's going to be just before the tonic and it's usually like the five chord and you know once you know those things it really is a process of elimination you know I find when transcribing um, the other thing I found with transcribing is um, a lot of the transcribing I was doing because I was singing, I really, I was in an a cappella group or two or three and there were n hardly any arrangements for more popular songs at the time. You just could not buy them. So I, I started doing them myself and transcribing recordings of a cappella groups that I found who were doing more popular music and 
And so when transcribing, you know, I'd listen to the person singing the top part and the middle part and the bottom part. It's often in four or five parts. And so you kind of end up picking out each line as you go and listening through to that one line. But I found that even if there was a section where I couldn't really work out what the chord was or what the no- all of the notes were at that time, I would go, well, I can definitely hear this note in the top and I can definitely hear this note in the bass. And once you've got two notes, it's much easier to fill in the gaps and go, well, the other two notes can only be this, this or this. And it's that process of elimination that, that's really, um, that was a really good realisation from that point on. That is one of my favourite activities in the world is listening to a cappella music or barbershop <laughs> and and just trying to really tune into the different voices. I think it's a, a phenomenal exercise for waking up your ears and developing your appreciation of that kind of thing. You know, what is the progression? What types of chords are being used? And where is the melody at any given time? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, you and I've talked about this in the past that, you know, listening and Listening with a purpose is always a really, really good thing and just picking out different parts. I still do it on the radio now, you know, driving with my kids and my kids are aged 11 and 12 and even they do it too. You know, my my eldest son, I look over at him one day and he's miming some piano part, which I hadn't even really picked up consciously myself in, a, in some song that we were listening to. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can hear that too. Yes. You know, and he obviously he's actively listening to certain parts too. And I just think that's a great exercise. And sometimes if I'm, I'm hearing the same song a lot, you know, you get bored with the same songs. <laughs> so uh, if you are forced to listen to something over and over, I, I do. I pick out, okay, let's do the guitar part this time or let's try and hone in on the bass part and um, fo- focus. I, I always think of it as um, kind of like focusing like a camera lens, focusing my my ears on a certain thing and, mm. yeah, it becomes much easier over time. That has been my saving grace lately. My daughter is about two and <laughs> is very much in the mode of needing the same song again and again and there's only so many times you can hear the theme to Princess Sophia before you start needing <laughs> something else to tune your ear into. Do you, do you do what I do, which is sing harmony parts and things? I, I make up harmony parts to go with the melody. <laughs> Definitely a good option. So I'd love to unpack that a little bit because I think what you touched on there is one of these things that if you see a musician do it or you hear them talk about, you know, can you hear that amazing bass riff or, you know, when they mention something you were oblivious to, it's easy to say, oh, they just have amazing ears, they're a better musician than me. But clearly this was something you've worked on and that you actively bother to do. Um, can you tell me more about that and, and what someone listening can think about if they're intrigued to kind of dig into music with their yeah. ear in this way? Yeah, and I do think it's a learnt thing. I think it's, and it, I think for me, it's often remembering to do it. You know, you can you can just like all day long, you'll hear different music. You know, when you're walking around and driving, and you know, uh, with a friend and in the shopping centre. But you know, you can really, con- if you can consciously remember to try and listen in a, a different way, just uh, with active ears or or whatever you want to term it. I actually had uh, my brother was uh, seeing a girl for a while. And she was around me and my dad and my brother a lot. And she said to us at one point, I feel like I'm missing out because you guys seem to listen and hear music in such a different way to me. And we all said, no, 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 we're not, you're not missing out at all. We just happen to listen to it in a different way to you, to, you know, to the way you do. So, so we started saying to her, you know, can you hear that little twanging sound at this point? And that's the guitar. And, and so she started to pick out different parts as well that, that that for me is you know I think the one of the best things altogether and just just picking out consciously picking out a part and you can sort of say okay there's a keyboard part in this in this um, song and just have a listen to that and and follow it all the way through and sometimes you'll lose it sometimes they may not even be playing through the whole song and you're like where did it go <laughs> but I think just listening to it and and doing that as a, a regular thing and um, you know, I make a point in the ra- and the car trips and that sort of thing. I don't even drive that much. I keep bringing car trips up, but it's the time where I, I have music on in this. Um, th- we have a certain amount of songs between here and the boys' school where I drop them off and we know that the trip has been bad, the traffic's busy if we get through five songs instead of four. We're like, okay, it's a bad day today. <laughs> but we, we go through and we each take turns in choosing songs, which is nice. Um, Eminem's featuring heavily uh, for my eldest son. So there's not a lot of musical musical interest in that. The, the lyrics are amazing and 
it's all about the lyrics and the rap, obviously, but um, the musical part, you know, that's what I hone in on. And um, actually, this is an aside, but I actually remember a few weeks ago saying to my son, oh, man, this song's so repetitive. And he just looked at me in horror and said, how could you say that? And I realized that it's because of the way I was listening to it. It was me listening to the musical back backing, which was completely repetitive. It's the same eight bars for three and a half minutes. And, you know, for him, he was listening to the lyrics and the rap. And I thought that's that's what his ears are tuned to at this point in time. And and he loves, you know, the, the expressiveness of the lyrics. And I thought, oh, yeah, I really need to take a step back and, you know, look at myself and actually actually do that where I listen to something different in, in each song. So, so yeah, I like to do that. I, I like to pick out chord sequences in songs. So I'll listen and try and say the chord names along with the song as I'm listening. So this is chord one to chord five to chord four to chord five to chord one and, and so on as I'm listening. And I think that's really good practice if you want to get into transcribing things or working out what the bass line is for a song or uh, working out what the chords are if you're a guitarist. And yeah, it's such a great thing to do. I think there have been some really interesting brain studies in the last decade where they use MRI and fMRI machines to try and figure out do musicians hear music differently and one of the major findings has been yes you know if you have some musical training you hear music essentially with the left side of your brain the analytical side where your average layperson in the street it wakes up the right side of their brain and they're just appreciating it as a casual listener and when I heard that, it made so much sense because I'd spent some time doing what you just described, you know, actively analyzing. And, you know, that makes it sound very boring and dry. It's not mm. at all. It is no. kind of like a, an amazing adventure playground that you get to explore. But it is that part of the brain that's trying to figure things out and trying to pay attention and, and listen for detail. And I, I think it, you don't need that much musical training to wake up your brain in that way. No, and not at all. I love those examples you give in the car of, you know, you don't need an instrument, you don't need a computer or a tablet, you can just listen and give yourself those little challenges or ideas for what you could listen for next. Yeah, Are there absolutely. any others that you found useful? Any other activities you tend to do when you're when you're just trying to listen actively? I think even um, just even practicing, like often when when I say, you know, to, to other people, I, I listen and pick out chord sequences in songs, but that sounds overwhelming and it would be if you were just starting out and, and even just picking out, um, if you have an instrument handy, you know, so maybe not while you're driving in the car, but <laughs> if you have an instrument handy or even your phone with an app that can help you identify a specific tone and pitch, um, just even identifying what the, the tonic, the key of the song is, that can just be a really good exercise. I know lots of people struggle with that when they start out and I've seen lots of discussions on, on you know, like uh, online forums and uh, comments on YouTube videos and people saying, how do you work out, the, you know, what key the song is in? And, um, and then someone, you know, the person who's made the videos, they're trying to explain it. And, and I mean, there's, you know, different approaches, but you can always sort of think what's, what's the, the, the note that you're drawn back to all the time or what, do you, what does it end on or start on? That's often a good clue. It's not always that, you know, every time, but that's a good place to start. And that was one of the things that was included in the exam system that I did growing up. I did for Australia, we have the AMEB, so Australian Music Examinations Board. And um, a lot of us do those exams over time. And they have a little ear training section, which is like an add-on at the end of your exam after you've played your pieces, you'll have to do some ear training exercises uh, with the examiner. They'll test you on a few things. And a lot of um, teachers don't emphasize that part of the learning for the student who's going to take the exam, which I think is a big issue <laughs> for at times, because a lot of students go into the exam and then freeze at that part because they haven't had that practice all, all along. But one of the things is, you know, in the early days, they play a little piano thing. It might be just like four bars and they stop just before the last note. And then you have to sing the very final note, which is usually the, the key of the song, the tonic note. And even just doing that is a really good exercise when you're starting out. But, yep, saying the, the chords out loud in the car is a good thing if you can. Um, the hard thing, I guess, is that you can't really check it while you're driving. But anyway, <laughs> that's one thing. And um, just choosing a little short rhythm. I think uh, one of the things I found growing up with transcribing is 
people can often pick out pictures uh, more easily or more quickly. They pick up that part of the process more quickly than the rhythm. And I think the rhythm, the rhythm to me is like, I love the rhythmic aspect of transcribing and writing down, you know, what I'm hearing. And that's always the thing I do first. So, and I know, I know a lot of people teach this, you know, if you, if you want to notate something, you just write the rhythm down first. The pictures are kind of easier to fill in the gaps afterwards. And so I will often pick out just a little rhythm for practice and write that down and um, and then just compare it to the original song. And if you are not able to kind of work out and compare the two and work out whether you what you've done is accurate, if you can put it into a notation program, that's a really good way of, of what I call proof listening. Someone else came up with that term. It's not an original one of mine, but if you put it into a notation program and play it back, the, the notation program, you can really easily at that point say, oh yeah, that sounds the same as the rhythm I wanted to transcribe or that sounds completely different and I've got it utterly wrong. <laughs> so it's a really great way to just do that quick comparison. So I often do that, you know, just one bar or two bars of music. And if you do that fairly regularly, it's, oh, you just get, yeah, just get much more into it. Very cool. So we've hit on there what is, I think, unquestionably your main expertise. You you host the Music Tech Teacher podcast and at Midnight Music, you very much specialize in how to leverage technology to make teaching and learning music easier and more fun and, and really make the most of it. Um, it's a slightly controversial topic, I think, and Maybe that comes from this traditional system that a lot of teachers are resistant to change or apprehensive about introducing these new tools. But to me, at the heart of it, there's a really big question of whether technology is enabling better music learning or actually removing the need for music learning. If we take something like that example of notating a rhythm, if there are apps that make it easy to, to figure that out or to you know auto-generate a rhythm for you, is there still a need to learn the skill of doing it yourself. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I totally think there's still a need to do it yourself. I think that there's um, there's a couple of different things. There's, you know, when using something like GarageBand, which has a loop library and, and so on, you know, people are like, well, why would you bother learning how to compose? You can just drag a whole stack of loops in and, and use that. And you can, but if you've ever done it, you can make something that sounds really, really bad very easily. And you still need to know about a good form, you know, how to, how to set up a good song with form. You still need to know how uh, harmonies work with one another because you can pick loops in the loop library which do not match at all. And if you've ever done this with a group of students, you know, particularly say, let's say, you know, teenagers, they will drag in as much as possible at all times. And therefore, and it's good to let them do that because then they listen and they go, this sounds really crap. And it does not sound like the top 40 song that I really wanted it to be. And then they have to learn that a good song does not have six drum parts. You know, a good song probably just has one drum part and maybe some other percussion on another track, but really it's very limited. And um, using lots of different chords in one song is probably not going to make it sound good. Using a limited number is going to make it sound better and, and how the melody flows and stuff. So I think you really do need to do that. And the one thing that people say to me over and over again, and this is, you know, specifically to do with ear training, is along the lines of that transcribing thing. So, you know, there's software now where in theory <laughs> you can open up a recording, a waveform or an MP3 and into some software and that it will churn out notation for you. Now, there's a number of software companies that do this and it is getting better over time, but it still does not give you this amazing result. You know, the technology is just not there, particularly if you're wanting to transcribe multiple tracks multiple parts you know it generally speaking it's it's like it can do sometimes a single melody a single line um so people have dreams i often get asked you know is there technology that will allow me to bring in um you know name the top 40 song of the moment and it will spit out parts for me to give to my band members to play and the answer is no <laughs> it won't and if it does they're probably going to be incorrect and so you're going to need to go through with your good ear, ear training skills and go through and correct things anyway. And 
you know, I just think there's no substitute for for those ear training skills and the compositional kind of skills as well. So using the the software, I mean, there are I think there are some aspects of software which help help you and maybe take away the need for a teacher at all times. I mean, I I love ear training software where you need to be drilled, you know, it, it's all about practice and, and doing it frequently. So you need to be drilled on certain things. So rhythmic examples, um, you know, for one thing, you might need to listen to many rhythmic examples and um, notate them or tap along with them or keep the beat with a rhythm or something like that. And to have someone sitting there with you for three hours, you know, a week, <laughs> it would be nice, but you're not going to always get to do that. So having software that can do that for you, it's brilliant. I mean, it's great. So in that way, the teacher is made a little bit redundant because the software can drill for you all of those exercises. But but that's a good that's a good use of the software. I'm sure most teachers would be happy to be made redundant in that instance <laughs> and not have to play examples all day for people. So I've loved that over time. The the ability for um, for anyone, students, adults, to to do ear training on the go. You know, with the like with the technology today, you can on your iPad or your phone or your laptop have software that will allow you to practice those things. It's amazing. It's so great. I had a teacher friend who, before the days of apps of of iPhones and, and iPads. Um, kids that, that she was teaching had iPods at the time. So they had something that they could listen to while they were on the train or the bus. And she made for them, she recorded a whole stack of, of ear training exercises, so intervals, for instance. And she, in the exercise, she would, I think, play the interval a couple of times and then leave a gap on the recording for them to guess what it was. And then she would say the name of it so they could compare their answer. And she said that the improvement in their grades that that in that year, the first year she did it was amazing. Like it just, it really increased their their success levels. And it was because they could do it anytime. They could sit on the train on the way to school and do it or on the way home. And yeah, and she said it was just such a better use of their time. And, and then after that, of course, apps came along, which just do all that for you, which is great. And so the teacher doesn't have to set up their own recordings anymore. Such a great, a great thing that's come along. Mm, that's a, a really cool example. I, I think to me, you can just about make the case that maybe in the future people won't need to learn to play an instrument and there are increasing options for replacing that instrument skill. But I'm 100% in agreement that the one part you're always going to need is your ear and your ability to evaluate, is this good or bad? Is the thing I've just created what I wanted to create? And to even, you know, when we were talking about active listening there, to even conjure up in your mind what it is you're trying to create requires a certain level of analysis and understanding of music that you can then bring out through an instrument or through a tool or through software, whatever it may be. Yeah, um, yeah mm. absolutely. And I think also that um, just that knowledge of, you know, even if you're trying to write songs, knowing what the rules are in inverted commas, uh, which you can then break down the track. But if you learn those kind of rules in the first place, it it just makes your process a lot easier and then you can be much more creative with it afterwards. And, um, yeah, I think that's that's a really good way. You know, again, students, you know, when they are in software, they'll do that thing where they use lots of chords and lots of things and, and often that's a little bit too much and when you take a few things out, it becomes better. But you need to kind of know why why you're doing that or how to do that. And if you've learnt that background of of chord progressions and, um, you know, useful rhythms, even with rhythms, things like filling in the gaps when you're creating a rhythm yourself. Like I often use those, uh, you know, like an online sequencer, which allows you to build up a drum pattern, for instance, and you'll, you'll have a track for the bass drum, the kick drum, uh, one for the snare and one for the hi-hat. And if you know that, you know, if the kick drum is on one, and you put the snare on two and four, pretty much then you can go crazy after that and, and add stuff in, but not too crazy. So at that point, I often fill in the gap. So I look at if you're using one of those step sequences, which has little boxes that you turn sounds on and off in, which are just fabulous. I often go and fill in the gaps and that makes a really good sounding rhythm without you needing to know whether it's crotchets or quavers that you're playing and even what beat things are on. But if you put a couple of things in place and then after that, fill in the gaps and you know try and make it sound a little bit interesting you can do that quite easily 
and come up with something cool and make your beats and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I've had to adjust my terminology over the years. You know, I used to like, no, a beat is not the entire rhythmic um, pattern. It's just the beat. But now I've come to, okay, the beat, it's now like, okay, that's the whole rhythmic pattern, you know, the terminology <laughs> these days. <laughs> I've had to let it go. I was speaking to, on my own podcast, Richard McCready, who's a teacher in the States, and we were comparing you know, we sounded like old people, like we're comparing terms that we've had to like let go over time because they've become commonplace. Acapella is another one. You know, when you're talking about remix stems, you know, if you want to get separate tracks for a song and then you're going to put them together in your own way to create a remix, you know, lots of people do this, DJs and stuff. And if you are ever looking for the unaccompanied vocal track, it's just the pure vocals on its own started off being called the a cappella, as in the unaccompanied vocal and then it got shortened to pels and so if you go to some websites and you click on the menu which is pels that's where you're going to find unaccompanied vocal tracks <laughs> <I> just <laughs> let it go <laughs> let it go <laughs> so that that's a perfect example i i knew of them being referred to as the a cappella um for a track but i had not come across that vocabulary pels, of pels yeah. And CC Mixto. If you go to the CC oh, yeah. Mixto website, yeah, there's a remix stems on there and it's Pels, is the, the menu. I think. But that's a perfect example of what I've always admired so much about Midnight Music is you are always at the cutting edge and you are always totally tuned in to what the latest tools are and what the latest technology opportunities are. I'd love if you could just share a few examples of what you would recommend our listeners check out in terms of, you know, taking advantage of online tools to develop their own musicality. Yeah, and it's funny because, um, you know, lots of people say, oh, it changes so often, you know, all the time and how do you keep up with it? And it doesn't, and I actually don't, I don't make a massive effort to seek out new information. It kind of comes to me because, you know, I'm in Facebook groups or whatever it is. And often I'm not the person breaking the news and I just wait for it to come. Someone will post something at some time and then I, I but I do make a note of it mentally and go, right, I've got to look that up or check it out and, and that sort of thing. But, but over the years, I found really a lot of the things that I use and that I recommend other people use have not changed that much. It's the same websites or the same software and yes they get updated over time but I still go back to the same ones that I've been using for eight years now and they are still around and a few new things have come on board in that time but um, things that I love are just often really simple so um, there's one called Groove Pizza there's a the department of um, you know music department education department at NYU uh, have some fantastic things that they're doing and they're building free online music tools for particularly for teachers and students to use but they're great for everyone so <clears throat> one of theirs is called Groove Pizza and it's one of these online drum sequencer tools and it, it doesn't test you on anything but it's a great place for you to build up a drum pattern and I love this for just either exploring rhythm yourself it's a great way to do it so you could do that thing where you, you build up a pattern with a kick drum and a snare drum and it's only got three parts so you're limited which is good but I love to suggest to people use that as your accompaniment for when you're playing scales, you know. Just put a, a really basic drum pattern on and instead of play, playing scales or modes along to a metronome, which is tick, tock, tick, tock all the time, you can have some funky rhythm going. And so I often suggest that and you can make the tempo really slow and then, you know, increase it over time. And you can even export those little drum patterns from that website. You get an MP3 and or a WAV file and therefore you can save them somewhere. You can save them on your laptop or put them onto your device and, and take them with you. And there's lots of apps that will do that too, but just really, really simple things. There's a, there's a really simple, um, and it's, it's kind of almost silly, there's a simple website you can go to. It's called Got Rhythm. I think it's part of a, like a concert booking venue website. I think they just made this little tool. Essentially, it, it, it gives you something rhythmic to tap your space bar along to. And at some point, the backing drops out. So there's nothing at all. And you need to keep the same beat going. And then it brings in the backing again and it says, okay, you can stop now. And it gives you a score on how accurate your beat keeping was in the time that, you know, that it wasn't there for you to, to play along with. And that's kind of cool. You instantly get a score like 738. <laughs> and so straight away, you just want to get a better score. So you go back and you do it again. And it's, it's a quick thing to do, but 
just to practice keeping a steady beat, um, even when you're not playing along to a metronome or looking at a conductor, that's a, a really great thing to do. And there's a few other tools. I mean, there's a number of ear training tools out there. There's, I mean, so many nowadays. And I really find the free ones aren't the best option. You know, you, you, I find it the, the ones which you pay a little bit of money for, you're going to get much better results from those because there's so much more flexibility and you can pick and choose and set up your own exercises and customize them a lot. So um, I, I really love Aurelia software, fantastic for ear training um, and the online um, theatre, theatre music. I never say their name quite right, but theatre music's great too. Use it online, log in. And again, they've got some for free but then you can pay for extra and, you know, you're going to get a better experience, you know, keeping track of what you do and, and that sort of thing. But stuff like that and, and note naming even, there's lots of note naming apps out there. I've been a big fan of one called Staff Wars uh, over the years. It's a great one for, for kids and adults as well. It's got this Star Wars space theme going on and uh, a note flies in across the stave and you have to identify it before it reaches the, stay, the, the treble clef or the bass clef or tenor clef. Um, and if you do identify it correctly, it gets shot by your spaceship. So it's kind of cool. And they even have a playing version, like a, a um, one where you play your instrument to identify the note. So the first one uh, that I mentioned, you press a key on your keyboard to say this is an A or an F. But the second one, you can play your instrument and it picks up your instrument through the microphone of your device. And if you play a G and it's a G, the spaceship shoots the G for you. So that's really cool. <laughs> Lots of fun. But yeah, there's a few others as well, but th those are, you know, amongst the ones that I keep going back to over time and they're, they're around, you know, still around. Fantastic. Those are really fun suggestions and we'll put links to all of those in the show notes. That was just a little taste, though, of the full range of things you recommend and provide tutorials for on Midnight Music, your website. I believe you have an ultimate free music tech resources guide yes, available. Yes, which I'll link to right? as well. Yeah, lots of those ones that I've just mentioned are in there too. So that, um, you know, I work with teachers most of the time. So the focus of what I do is professional development for teachers in using technology with students. And, and so I was collecting kind of free websites and things over time. And then I thought, gee, I've got quite a lot. I might put them into some kind of PDF and and so I did that and then the PDF's grown I think I did the first one back in 2012 or 11 or something and so pretty much every year I've just updated it and a few things have died off free websites tend to die off more readily than you know apps where people are putting money in and <laughs> investing and, and developing them properly um, not properly but you know continually uh, investing in them but the free ones, a lot of the free ones, uh, like I said, are, are around, they've been around since those very early days and they are still in that guide and I'll add new things along as they come to, you know, across my laptop desk and just add them in each year and remove anything that's died off. But, but that's grown quite a lot now. So, yeah, so useful for anyone, teacher or not teacher. Um, it, it's a, a really good, good sort of list of, of things that you can use there, which are all free. Awesome. And I know we do have a lot of teachers in our audience who I imagine are feeling both inspired and maybe even a little intimidated listening <laughs> to this conversation and realizing all of the opportunity that's out there to leverage technology. But, you know, aside from that list of resources, not necessarily knowing where to start or how to incorporate this stuff into their teaching. You have an online community to help people just like that, the Midnight Music community. Can you tell us about what's going on in there? Yeah, and I think that's, you mentioned uh, knowing what to do with it. That's often the biggest question. So, you know, lots of people, um, so teachers that I deal with, they they are often have thrust upon them a device that they're using with their students. So, you know, hey, teacher, we're getting iPads next year. And, and they're kind of like, oh, okay. And in my early days of doing these, you know, I started off really running workshops for people and um, doing sort of software training and that sort of thing. It became very apparent that it was the, not how to use the software, it was more about what to do with it with the students that was the bigger question. You know, you can pretty easily find software, straight up software tutorials for anything online and YouTube and so on, or read the manual if anyone actually reads the manual apart from me. Um, I do actually read the manual a lot of the time. <laughs> but um, it was more about, yeah, I can work out how to use the software, but what is the idea, you know, that I'm going to do with the kids and how to do it in the classroom and make it meaningful and useful. And, 
you, you don't want to shoehorn technology in for the sake of it. You know, you want to make it just a natural progression or a, my theory is to only use it if it's actually helping what you're teaching. And if it's not, don't use it. Like, just don't use it at all. If it's better for you to play and sing to demonstrate the, the concept that you want the kids to learn, then do that instead. But often I find you can... You can pretty much, you know, often weave it in naturally into to what you're teaching. And so my theory is always, you know, the singing and the playing usually comes first, but then you might want the kids to become more conscious about the, the clapping game that you've just done with them. And therefore, they might kind of work out, well, where do the beats fall and where does the rhythm fall in a bar? And so you might take that rhythm and get them to sort of consciously work it out. And this is where that conscious listening comes in. And then they might transfer that into that Groove Pizza online drum sequencing tool that I you know, mentioned earlier. So I, I do this actually exercise in one of my workshops. We do the boom, snap, clap, clapping game, which is a simple clapping game with just three sounds in it. And then we work out, okay, so where, how many sounds are there and where do they fall and in which order? And then we go to Groove Pizza and we recreate the boom, snap, clap rhythm in there. And that's quite nice and easy to do. And then, you know, the next progression might be to compose something to go with that. So a melody or perhaps to write a rap that goes over the top of the, the backing that you've just created. So I love this idea of weaving things in naturally as you go. And I think when I started, um, there was a lot of ostriches and teachers who were like, I, I sure if I just ignore this technology thing, it will go away. And in the early days when I was running workshops, there was access to technology, but it wasn't it wasn't a massive part of the curriculum. But now it's man it's mandated part of the curriculum. You know, teachers actually kind of have to include it. So, um, so they're often looking for ways to do that. And I've seen a big shift in the attitude towards technology. I think a lot of people have realised that yes, it actually can help and it can enhance what you do. And there are some great things you can do with technology that you cannot do without it. And so, you know, in that way, it's a really good thing. But like I said, if you, if it's not working and it's not going to help, then don't use it. <laughs> but yeah, so my online community is essentially um, the, the thing I set up. I, I started off running workshops and then progressed into online courses at one point. And I ended up with a whole stack of different online courses. And in the end, I thought this is really, really hard because my audience is so split between Australia and the States and, you know, other places in Europe. Um, to run an online course at a specific time that works for everyone, just it, it wasn't, you know, an easy thing to do. And our school years are also at opposite ends. So here in Australia, it's towards the end of our school year. We're about to hit summer. We're finishing up for the year. And in the States, for instance, you know, kind of halfway through this school year. So to run workshops or online courses that would work for everyone, just it wasn't, it was a hard thing. So I ended up having this online community and putting everything in there you can access it at any time and it's such a better setup for me and and everybody else as well. And and so that's what we we do. We talk about lesson plan ideas and there are software tutorials in there too, but it's always the focus is what's what's the thing you're teaching? Is it songwriting or the blues or um, you know, some rhythmic sort of thing? Are you teaching how to do drum patterns and so on? And and so that's the big focus and it's lots of fun. Amazing. I think that's such a valuable problem to be solving. I'm really glad yeah. that you are out there helping music teachers in this way because I feel their pain. I, I know how frustrating it can be when they, as you say, get an iPad thrust on them or they can just see how cool it could be to leverage technology, but without someone to kind of walk them through some examples and explain, as you just did, you know, it can be a part of your syllabus part of your lesson plan not the be all end all suddenly switch to technology uh, i think that's yeah. such a wonderful thing to be doing yeah and it's great i mean you see things often i'm inspired by things i see online so um live looping is like this passionate area i don't get time to do it very much but you know it's the, the thing where you'll see like ed sheeran does this a lot he's i think his latest um, tour, you know, show that he's taking around the world is it's basically just him on stage and he can do that and, and have a full sounding backing behind him because he's using a live looping pedal and he, you know, he'll play a little guitar riff and that's recorded and plays back over and over and over and then he'll layer on another part on top of that and then he'll layer another part on and it's some, something might be a rhythmic part 
and he builds up this amazing backing just him on stage and lots of people are doing this live looping thing and then he can sing the song turn parts on and off as needed during the song and um, be his own one-man band and and I love this there's um, an iPad app which allows you to do this really easily instead of spending three or four hundred dollars on a guitar looping pedal which is great there's an app called Loopy, which I love and allows you to do this. And it's been featured on the Jimmy Fallon Late Show quite a lot. So it's seeing things like that in action, I kind of like, oh, kids would love to do that, I'm sure. And so therefore I end up creating a you know, video tutorial for, for the teachers on how they could incorporate this with students at all levels and on a really basic level. But then the, the kids that are really into it can take it a lot further as well. And yes, yeah, so I'm often inspired that at multi-tracking acapella uh, videos on YouTube as well. I often get asked, how do I, how would I do that with my kids? You know, those ones where you're watching and you can see the same person singing eight different parts or nine parts on the screen and you can see them in different boxes in the video and, you know, doing that sort of thing, that, that's going to be one of my upcoming tutorials is how you could do this with students in a, on a simple level. It's not that easy to do that one, but <laughs> you could do it, I'm sure. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I love the insights you've shared today, both for the musician in the car, waking up their ears, listening along, uh, to the music teacher who is trying to do very specific technology-oriented tasks. And I would highly recommend whether you're listening to this as a musician, a self-taught musician maybe, or you're a music teacher, definitely head to midnightmusic.com.au where you will find all that Katie publishes as well as information on that community we mentioned Thank you so much, Katie, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Great to talk to you, Christopher. Unlock your full musicality with Musical You membership. Find out more at musicalitypodcast.com forward slash join. That was really cool. I have such respect for the way Katie took the formal training she started with and then had the drive and dedication to explore some more creative avenues and develop her musicality. And now she's one of the main thought leaders when it comes to using technology in creative and effective ways for music learning. Katie had an early start in music because both her parents were in fact music teachers. She started piano at age five and learned several other instruments in her school days, including a sneaky rebellious project to teach herself the bassoon. Growing up with two music teacher parents, it was perhaps particularly likely that Katie would herself go into music, but in her opinion, it was more nurture than nature. Being immersed into the world of music was what gave her the training and ability to become a musician and a music teacher herself, more than it was any innate talent. Although her music training was in the formal, classical tradition, she started to explore the more experimental and creative side of music making, and there it helped her to have a brother who was in the same boat and happy to spend time just trying stuff out. I'm reminded of our previous interview with Dr. Melody Payne, where she talked about having a friend early on in her music learning who was great at jamming and improvising, and just spending time together and experimenting and playing around with stuff went a long way to helping her develop a more flexible musical ear. Katie enjoyed trying to transcribe songs from the radio, like Billy Joel or Elton John, which is quite an advanced skill from a young musician. What stopped it being overwhelming or too difficult for her was the insight that, generally speaking, everything is based around the key. The notes are probably from the scale, and the chord progression is probably going to draw from the key's chords. Learning to think in relative terms, interpreting notes in terms of the tonic note, and thinking about chords with the Roman numeral numbering system really helped her to sight-sing and transcribe music. Another big part of how she developed her musicality was active listening, learning to pick apart music by ear. This came naturally from her transcription practice, trying to hear the different voices present. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to check out our past episodes on active listening and on transcribing music. Katie gave several great examples of how you can usefully start listening to music rather than just hearing it. You can pick a particular instrument like the bass, keyboard, or vocals, and try to follow that through the track. You can try and hear and then sing back the tonic note. If you've done some ear training on recognizing chords, then you can try and name the chords in the progression by their number. You can also take a short section and try to figure out how you'd notate the rhythm being used. 
For some of these, you'd want to have an instrument or notation software or a simple mobile app handy to check your answers. But other ones you can do purely with your ears and your brain. Katie's real specialty is music technology for education, and I was really glad to have the chance to ask her to share some of the tools she likes and which can be used for musicality training. Katie mentioned Groove Pizza, a fun rhythm sequencer that you can use to experiment with different rhythm patterns and get a feel for how to put rhythms together yourself. She also mentioned the Got Rhythm test for how well you can keep a beat. She recommended Theta Music Trainer, and check out episode 8 of this podcast for my interview with Theta founder Steve Myers. Another suggestion was Staff Wars, which gives you practice naming or even playing notes from traditional staff notation. We'll have links to all of those in the show notes for this episode. Katie is really at the forefront of how to best use technology to aid music learning. And I love how she doesn't just recommend new tools or make suggestions of what to use. She actually lays out how to use those tools and how they can fit into existing lesson plans and syllabus in a coherent and useful way. She has a lot of terrific resources available at midnightmusic.com.au both for individual musicians and particularly for music teachers who want to better understand how to leverage new technology in their teaching. And of course, she has the Midnight Music community that we mentioned earlier, where she provides full training and support for teachers in this area. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Katie, both about how she developed her own musicality without relying on technology and also how she now uses and teaches the technology that can be most fun and effective for accelerating your music learning. Definitely go check out the Midnight Music website and try one or more of the tools mentioned in this conversation. We'll have links to all of those in the show notes at musicalitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about grid notation for rhythm, as featured in Groove Pizza and in other fun music-making tools. What is grid notation, and why might it be useful for your musicality to learn it? Find out in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcasts.